This is the Iceman John Scully, former uh, boxer and boxing trainer now, and I listen to the Ringside Boxing Show. Live from Monterey on California's beautiful Central Coast, this is the Ringside Boxing Show. I'm Dennis Taylor welcoming you to join me and my expert analysts, Travis Hartman, Rizwan Zahid, and John J. Responsi today and every week for the hottest, sweatiest show on the West Coast. And now, from Studio 1A, it's the Ringside Boxing Show. Welcome to the Ringside Boxing Show on the Grueling Truth Sports Network. I'm Dennis Taylor, and we got an interesting show coming up for you. Our inimitable boxing historian, Christopher James Shelton, is going to take us back to the late 1800s today. Um, I don't know how he finds this stuff, but he does, and he's going to talk to us about what the boxing world was like way back then and a champion by the name of Peter Maher. Um, this is fascinating stuff, so you're going to want to stick around for that. Our British correspondent, Paul McLaughlin, is with us this week to catch us up on all the stuff that's been happening on his side of the Atlantic, including that big heavyweight uh, fight between Anthony Joshua and Alexander Povetkin on Saturday. And right now we're going to get some insight on that fight and some other stuff um, from the week in boxing from our expert analyst. Travis Hartman is a professional boxer and boxing trainer from Osborne, Missouri. He's now living and training in Orlando, Florida. Rizwan Zahid is a boxing journalist from Toronto. John J. Responti is chief lead writer from MaxBoxing.com and DoghouseBoxing.com, and John and I are co-authors of an Amazon bestseller, Intimate Warfare, the true story of the Arturo Gatti and Mickey Ward boxing trilogy. Um, Hey, Travis, you got a a promotion in the works uh, pretty soon up there in Missouri. Uh, What's going on, buddy? Yeah, I do. It's going to be my second uh, professional boxing matches, and my brother, Drew, who's undefeated 9-0, is going to headline it. And uh, the, the first show I put on, I actually fought on and promoted it, but this one, I'm just going to promote it so I can uh, devote my full time to doing that since I'm kind of semi-retired that now. So I'm going to uh, give my full effort to the promoting. And then I actually have another show already planned as well for May 11th um, at the same place. It's uh, Phil Welch Stadium in St. Joe, Missouri. So I'm giving it a pretty solid run, guys, with promoting gig. So we'll see how that goes. But as most people in the boxing world know, promoters generally don't make a lot of money on the smaller level, so we'll see how it goes uh, after that, but it should be a good night. We have a lot of uh, talent here in, in the Kansas City and St. Joe area, so um, hopefully a couple of these guys get a couple more wins, and you guys will see them on TV somewhere fighting, you know, on ESPN undercard or something like that, and maybe uh, maybe we'll get lucky enough and one of them will have a breakout, and, and I can say that I promoted those guys, but right now it's uh, October 20th in St. Joe, and I'm pretty excited about it. It's pretty stressful, but um, just promoting is a little bit easier than promoting and fighting, so I'm, I'm pretty much looking forward to that right now. Uh, way cool. Are, are, is there a place people can get tickets already? Uh, yeah, well, I'm just the fighters have the tickets, and I have tickets as well, so I'm not big time enough to, to go to Ticketmaster and, and such. Okay. So uh, we're just individually selling tickets like that. So our Facebook page, uh, the Hartman Team uh, Boxing, is the Facebook page, and then as well as you know my page, which is Travis Hartman. So anywhere like that, you can find tickets to, to the show and. Uh, Go ahead and pre-order them. Okay, sounds good. Hey, guys, uh, Pavetkin is a Russian heavyweight who has been feared and ducked throughout his career, I think. And uh, mm-hmm. I think Anthony Joshua um, was genuinely a little worried about fighting this guy on, on Saturday at Wembley Stadium, even though Pavetkin's 39 years old. And um, Pavetkin gave gave Joshua some problems, uh, even bloodied his nose mm-hmm. in the second round, and um, but size Stadium. and youth prevailed. And uh, Joshua got him uh, with two knockdowns and a TKO in the seventh round. Um, Riz, let's start with you. You messaged the rest of us that it was a kind of a fun and interesting fight. W- was it a fair fight? Did four inches in, in, uh, in height and 25 pounds in weight difference uh, ultimately make it unfair? I wouldn't say it made it unfair, but it made um, the end result. Um, you know, if you're watching the fight, and I was looking at it, when I saw the headline that it said Joshua outweighs Pavetkin by 25 pounds, and I was wondering, I'm like, did, did Joshua came in like heavy or fat or something like that? And then I saw, no, Pavetkin just came in very light. Pavetkin was 222 pounds, and I was just looking at it. That's the lightest he's been, I think, since his ninth pro fight or tenth pro fight. So I know he was taking the fight seriously. That's number one. Um, number two, he's never fought on the road, really. He's, he's for the most part, been very comfortable to fight uh, at home in Russia. And... Um, you know, I think Povetkin, from what I remember, I, I believe he was an Olympic gold medalist. If yeah, not Olympic gold medalist, then he was a, a very accomplished amateur. 
Um, yeah, and I remember when. Amazing. Yeah, yeah, he, he was he, he finished. Was he, he was really well, right? And yeah. I remember when he started his career. Um, you know, I remember when he was like six and zero oh on his way up. He was fighting guys who've already, you know, who've been kind of contenders and have, you know, who were guys who who were just on Friday night fights, you know, back then and were in the main events and. He was, you know, he was fighting them on, you know, f- five fights in. I think he knocked out Chris Bird in like his 11th pro fight or something. So, but that has been around for a really long time, and he's had a lot of miles on him, especially his amateur, uh, his amateur career too. So, watching the fight, you had to have known that Povetkin was a very well schooled fighter, and we saw that yesterday. I mean, he was slipping and ducking and like coming out with the right hand, but you also saw that he kind of had, um, you know, I wouldn't say he didn't have a really sustainable. Um, a sustainable plan for 12 rounds because ultimately the youth, the size, the power, and, you know, just the athleticism of Anthony Joshua um, is what allowed him to kind of get back in the fight. But you saw a lot of holes in Joshua too. I mean, there was, he got slightly rocked from a, a good kind of left hook inside and, and a shot to be mm-hmm. honest that he shouldn't just, he shouldn't be, um, he shouldn't be taking, right? I mean, for all mm-hmm. the, you know, the athleticism and all that stuff that Joshua has, it's funny that he's been able to beat bigger guys, no problems because, I get with bigger guys, he's able to, you know, he he's not really um, for a guy his size, he doesn't do anything anything at all from the outside. He's he's an inside fighter actually in a lot of ways, but against uh, you know against a smaller guy, that's not what you want to do. So he made it a lot harder on himself. He wasn't you know pumping a jab and like and circling around the ring. He was he was just trying to like he was trying to move. Um, you know, he was in the pocket. and He was trying to avoid shots. And against a guy as well schooled as Pavetkin, that wasn't going to happen. Um, but then, you know, Joshua, you know, both of them, both of them had cuts on them early. Joshua's nose was, was bloodied up after a couple of rounds. Um, then you saw Pavetti tying a little bit. He was going to body. Joshua's always been a very good body puncher, especially for a guy who's not, who hasn't actually been in the sport comparatively as long as other fighters. Um, so he's, uh, you know, he, he started hitting the jab a little more and then, uh, you know, his power started taking over. So even though, you know, halfway through the fight, a lot of, a lot of judges had it relatively even or close, um, it was one of those fights where it's like you saw the momentum kind of swing completely the other way. And uh, you didn't think it was necessarily a matter of time before Povetkin knocked out, got knocked out, but you saw that it was, it was going to be harder and harder for Povetkin to kind of keep this, his fight. Cause he was kind of getting gas. He used a lot of energy to make Joshua uncomfortable early, but um, you know, Joshua was able to kind of be methodical, but I mean, it's funny because uh, Povetkin was this close to fighting Wilder in Russia and, the way he fought last night, I don't think there's any guarantees that Wilder would have won that fight. Um, you know, fighting on the roads, completely different animal, especially in Russia. And, and uh, you know, Povetkin, like I said, he's been around for a really long time. And all the guys who've kind of been um, getting fights with Wilder and, and Joshua lately, um, Povetkin has been a lot of these kind of guys, right? I'm talking about guys like Carlos Takam, right? Uh, Povetkin's already knocked out guys like that. Um, you know, Povetkin's already went through the... I'd say, you know, where everyone, where the Wilder and Joshua are arguably the A and A plus fighters of, of the division, um, there's a lot of B, B plus fighters. Pavetkin's always been the A minus fighter. He's been a step above everyone else. His only loss against Vladimir Klitschko, um, you know, Klitschko, and it's where you really appreciate a guy like a guy like Vladimir because even though yes, Joshua knocked out Pavetkin, uh, Klitschko was never in danger of losing that fight. Um, mm-hmm. He schooled him for every second of that fight and knocked him down numerous times and. And this is where you're, um, you know, we can see where, you know, we're, we're looking at Joshua and Wilder. We can think that, you know what, there's, there's a lot of things that can go wrong before a fight like that is made um, because we see the vulnerabilities in both of those guys. And that's what, I mean, it makes Joshua entertaining also because, um, you know, he, he stumbled a bit, but he recuperates and he gets a, you know, a, a blitz ring knockout for a guy who's never been knocked out. Um, so it's what makes Joshua kind of the enigma that he is. And that's why he's been able to attract so much fans. It's it's really hard to dislike Joshua. That's what that's what I find. Um, he's I, very he's a, he's a very good interview. He's he's fun. He's entertaining. He's very um, you know. But he's he he has a respect amount amongst all of his opponents and amongst everyone else. I mean, we saw even with Povetkin, there's no trash talking building up really. And even during the fight when there was a I think it was like a head clash or like a low blow or something, a glove tap and they're right back into it. So um, you know, Joshua's Joshua's he's already becoming the must watch fighter. Um, mm-hmm. but as you know, as we saw the good, the bad, the ugly from him yesterday, I'm sure Wilder fans and Wilder's looking at this and thinking, if I land a shot, there's no way he's going to be standing up to it. Um, but at the same time, we're seeing that, well, clearly, you know, Povetkin has been around for a really long time, no, never been knocked out. And, uh, we know that if Joshua lands those kind of shots on Wilder, it might be over. So 
uh, slow. I think we did step one. Wilder and, and Fury will be step two, and then hopefully step three means uh, we'll see the fight that we want to see in April of next year. Mm -hmm. uh, John Pavetkin might be as many as seven years past his prime, I figure, but he still gave Joshua a lot of trouble. Um, Tyson Fury, of course, was unimpressed. He, he called Joshua a bum, um, but <laughs> Joshua ultimately took care of business. You know, only needed more than little more than half the fight to end it, and Povetkin had never been knocked out before. What kind of grade do you think Joshua gets for this? You wrote about it on Max.com. Oh, I would have gave him a, a, a probably a B. I, I, th I think Riz stole my thunder a little because of the thing that popped into my head was uh, the, the vulnerabilities that Fury and, and Joshua have, and that w that's what makes them so interesting. Yep. Uh they're not they're not great fighters to me. They're good fighters, but they have flaws and they get hit with punches they shouldn't and they lose rounds and you, you remember when Wilder was losing, I think he lost every round against Gerald Washington a few years ago and then whammo, he nailed him with the right hand and the fight was over. So in in that sense they're like can't miss because there's a good possibility not a good possibility, there's a possibility they could lose. And and things get exposed and 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 the points made again were good ones about Povetkin because Povetkin he was a different fighter than he was against David Price a few months ago. I wasn't impressed. I thought Joshua would blow him out in six. He didn't blow him out. He had some rocky moments. He got his knees got buckled in the first round, but he he came through it and he won. So uh, again, though, I think what makes it interesting to watch is because you know that there's a possibility that something can happen. It's not like the in the 80s when the early Tyson, what you were watching Tyson about was just to see him score a knockout. You never even thought he was going to lose. There wasn't really even a possibility most of the time in his early fights that he would lose. With Joshua and Wilder, you sense that something can happen, they could lose. You know, they, 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 they could get knocked out or they get not knocked out, but get hurt get staggered, get knocked down. There's all these things going on in your mind. So it, it is kind of compelling in that respect. And, and that's good because we want competition. You know, we want good fights. We don't, as much as we enjoyed watching Tyson blasting guys out, you know, it was almost a foregone conclusion what was going to happen. Here, you got these guys, there's like four guys that are good and then the rest are below them, that things can happen and it, it, it just, it just makes it fun to watch, you know, and you don't want to miss it. I mean, the 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 fight, the Joshua Povetkin fight, barely got any ink out here. I mean, yeah. I, we put some things on Max Boxing about it, but just in the last week. But it didn't matter. There were eighty thousand people at Wembley, mm -hmm. so that goes to again what Riz said about the popularity of the guy, and he is impossible not to like. I mean, he's he's articulate and he's nice. I saw a video of him going in the locker room and shaking Povetkin's hand, and, and they hugged each other. I mean, that's good sportsmanship, you know, and you want to see that. I like that. I, I, I do. I like that. And he's doing everything to be the image of boxing and more power to him. And then on the flip side, when you watch him, you just don't know what's going to happen, even though you think he's going to win. You also know, like in the first round, boom, his knee, knees got buckled, and his chin, I think, is a little susceptible. So it's... <laughs> It's really good for the sport because it, it makes it competitive and fun and interesting. And, and even people, I think, that don't love boxing will maybe want to watch it because mm -hmm. he's a big guy, 6'6", 250, but he's got flaws and he's vulnerable. And that, that's what I was basically focusing, uh, focusing on in my article on Max Boxing is it, 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 it is can't miss boxing TV in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, Travis, give us your impression to the fight, and also, when when he fights Wilder, is that fight simply going to be a matter of who lands that first monster punch? Yeah, I, I have a bold statement for you guys, and it, it could be laughable, but I think that Deontay Wilder is going to knock out Anthony Joshua if mm. they fight. And I say if because I think Anthony Joshua's camp did the smartest thing by avoiding Tyson Fury, because I think Tyson Fury is going to give uh, Deontay Wilder a whole heck of a lot of problems. And if Deontay Wilder can get past Tyson Fury, I am predicting that he's going to knock on Anthony Joshua. And then they're going to rematch, and it's going to be even bigger of a fight. But I, I've seen a lot of flaws for sure in Anthony Joshua, but when you're at heavyweight, the, it's not really huge flaws. It's just these heavyweights can punch. 
and it doesn't take much uh, to land that decent shot to put a guy, to buckle a guy or put a guy down, and that's just shown. I mean, Klitschko put uh, Joshua on his butt, and it was a really good shot. So what you can say about Joshua is he's got the, the grit and the determination to get up after a knockdown, which is very, very tough to see in heavyweights. I mean, most heavyweights go down. They're staying down because it was a big shot to put him down. But Anthony Joshua has got that, like uh, uh, John and, and Riz were saying, he's got that charisma. He's got that character to be one of the greatest out there just because he's so likable. He's so talented. He's a good-looking dude. He's always smiling. And I posted the video on Facebook of um, Anthony Joshua after he knocked out Povetkin and went to the locker room and was just like ultimate respect. And I said that only true uh, fighters know um, what it's like to have such respect for another guy after you knock him out. Most people see, they're like, oh my gosh, he just knocked him out in the seventh round. How is he nice to him now? And I'm just like, it's that ultimate respect that you battle somebody in the boxing ring that you, you go into the locker room afterwards and you have nothing but respect for that guy. And, and it was just classy. And that's what that's a good word, I think, for Anthony Joshua as well. Is just, he's a super classy guy. He's, I don't even know what, he, he really should be the face of boxing. The way he... Uh, it seems the way he behaves inside the ring and outside the ring is just amazing for kids to look up to. It's amazing to bring new fans, new boxers, new everything to boxing. I think he's one of those guys that can do that, and he has done that. I mean, he's putting in eighty to 90,000 people in Wembley Arena um, to see him knock out guys that everybody, all of us pretty much know that he's going to knock them out, but yet he still gets that many people there. So that's amazing to do right now, but I also think that, that Eddie Hearn and those guys, they – they did a really smart business move by not fighting Tyson Fury. Tyson Fury is just, he's one of those awkwardly talented guys. It just gives everybody a hard time. So I think they did a smart thing by letting Deontay Wilder deal with Tyson Fury first um, because if he can get past Tyson Fury, then it will be a blockbuster fight. But guys, I'm I'm calling it. I'm saying Deontay Wilder's going to knock out Anthony Joshua. If they fight, Deontay Wilder's going to knock out Anthony Joshua. I, I can see how anybody can say anything about that, but I just have a gut feeling in the way that uh, uh, Povetkin was was almost landing that overhand right on, on, on Joshua. I was just, and that was a left hand that staggered Povetkin, or that staggered Joshua from Povetkin. But I just see an overhand right just landing so flush on on Anthony Joshua and putting him on his can. And then it's going to make for an even bigger fight because hopefully this is what's going to happen. Deontay Wilder is going to have to get past Tyson Fury. When he gets past Tyson Fury, I think he's going to go over to England and fight. Uh, Anthony Joshua in you know ninety thousand seat, probably even bigger than that arena. And I think Deontay Wilder is going to knock out Anthony Joshua. They're going to do the rematch in America. Anthony Joshua hopefully can beat Deontay Wilder, and they're going to have a trilogy. I mean, how? When's the last time that we had a heavyweight trilogy? I think we're going to have it with these guys, and I think it's because Deontay Wilder is going to knock him out. <laughs> wow. Well. <laughs> <Wow. laughs> uh, uh, the the posturing has already begun for that fight, and Eddie Hearn just laid down a December deadline for Wilder to agree for the, the April 13th date. Um, I'm wondering, again, how much of a bully pulpit Hearn is going to have um, in the negotiations this time around if Wilder looks impressive against Tyson Fury Riz. Yep. Yeah, there, Riz. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know. I think in December... December deadline, I think it's fair, right? I mean, when like I don't think there's any doubt here who's quote unquote the A side, right? And that's Joshua, which means he's going to need a couple months, um, you know, when they're going to do the promotion and and all that kind of stuff. So um, I don't think a December deadline is, you know, really too unrealistic. Um, I don't know. I I, uh, I think what what they did uh, very well and what made most sense is rather than fighting Fury now. They're they're probably pretty fine with Fury fighting Wilder uh, because win win for them. Uh, Wilder wins and obviously it's the biggest fight. If Fury wins, that's still a pretty damn big fight in the UK and all of a sudden it means more because Fury oh, beat yeah. Wilder now, right? So Fury's now the, yeah. the clear number two guy. So kind of a win win for Anthony Joshua. And I mean, I hope what I what I hope is they don't do what kind of the whole Canelo Golovkin thing became, right? And this this formula of waiting till the other guy gets old. And even though um, Wilder, just with his style and athleticism, I don't think it will matter much because his, um, you know, he's he's never been a guy who's relying on necessarily like reflexes or any, you know, real traditional boxing boxing items, anyways. Um, but I just hope it doesn't it doesn't come to that point because it doesn't it doesn't need to be right. And uh, again, the heavyweight division is obviously very different. Uh, Povetkin was 39 yesterday, but 
I mean, I, I, I don't think, you know, him being 36 yesterday would have made a difference. Um, but I hope, I just hope that's not kind of the formula they're aiming for. Um, because the heavyweight division is, is a little, is a little stranger, um, because there's less, um, there's, there's, there's less credible opponents out there. And when Joshua Wilder is big as they are, I mean, Joshua went after Pavetkin, which I think is great. Um, I guess Luis Ortiz might be the next um, kind of filler opponent for Joshua. I doubt he'll, I doubt he'll be the filler opponent for Wilder. Um, so I, I think they've already kind of run through everyone else. And I, there's a big disparity, like I said, between kind of the A-level guys and everyone else in that division. So um, there's there's only so much they can get away with, I, th- I think, in terms of promotion and all that kind of stuff. And, 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 and Travis is absolutely right. This could be a trilogy, and honestly, I can see all three fights going one way. I can see all three fights going another way. Like, you can actually see every possible thing happening in this fight, right? Mm-hmm. A first-round knockout for either guy wouldn't surprise me. A 12th-round knockout for either of these guys wouldn't surprise me. Um, you know, Joshua dominating 12 rounds and losing wouldn't surprise me. You know what I mean? There's enough, And that's what makes this fight so intriguing, and that's why it's kind of a must-happen. And, and honestly, they must be watching this fight and thinking, you know, after the first round yesterday, I'm sure Joshua I must be thinking, okay, maybe we can't wait as long as we maybe were hoping to or thinking of doing because it doesn't work like that. Um, you know, you, you look at other, when you're, you know, Joshua, I don't think was overlooking. Um, Joshua was not overlooking Alexander Povetkin in the slightest, but clearly he's, um, you know, the, the, I think everyone else around him was, and Povetkin was not just coming in there to play the opponent. He was coming there to win and he, and, the first round, first couple of rounds, you're looking at that. If you look at the scorecards, you know, Povetkin on many scorecards was up like four rounds to two, um, and he was doing very well. So there's there's guys like that, right? Fury's the other one like that. Wilder obviously gave, um, or sorry, uh, Ortiz obviously gave Wilder hell already. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, you know, there's the the longer you wait, the more you're risking it. You know, I, I saw a headline and said Uriokis Gamboa and uh, Juan Ma Lopez are headlining a card in Miami. And it's like, wow, this would have been great in 2009, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. This is, this is, and and that, that's a good example of this whole idea of meriting a fight, trying to make it bigger, and it just doesn't happen. And that's what, and that's what happened to those two guys. The fight, that would have been an amazing fight eight years ago where they're looking at both of those two guys as like pound for pound, some of the best fighters in the world. And now they're just both look at like completely shot fighters who, I mean, this card in Miami, I don't think it's even going to be televised, right? Um, and that's that's kind of the risk you're running here. Um, you know, there's there's a fine line between um, getting the most out of your investment and being greedy. And I think, you know, um, although I wanted, we all wanted the heavyweight fight to happen this year, we're still getting two good fights out of it. Povetkin Joshua mm-hmm. is a good fight. Fury Wilder is a good fight. Um, but I think after April, I don't think there's anything else. So I, I think it has to be in April. And in fact... Uh, it, arguably it should be sooner, but I think, you know, because of when Wilder and Fury are fighting anyways, Joshua coming back sooner wouldn't, wouldn't make much sense. And you want a few months of build up fine. So I think April, April is the most logical step. I think if you run, if you, if you even, you know, pass on that, um, you're risking a lot. And this is, again, this is not so much like Canelo and Glovkin because I mean, Canelo kind of made his own division was fighting, you know, Chavez Jr. and Amir Khan. Um, Golovkin was kind of trying to fight anyone that's kind of willing to get in the ring with him. But, you know, Joshua, Joshua still brings a lot of money. So everyone's going to want to get in the ring with him. So he doesn't have, you know, he doesn't have that issue. Um, but I just think there's less credible opponents. And I don't, I just don't think fans and, and, you know, with the whole DAZN deal and Eddie Hearn, like there's pressure to make the fight from not just the boxer standpoint, but they can't get away as the streaming service. This is the risk you run, right? Um, are, are you know they they signed a billion dollar deal they they're not doing it because they wanted um you know the zone has has you know i think they have some nfl on there they have champions league on their soccer like they have you know the best the finals the championships right they can't have joshua fighting bums it's just it's they're not going to stand for it either so there's pressure all around to make this fight happen and the money's there i mean they delayed it once, which I mean, let's face it, in boxing, it's pretty much standard now. Um, mm-hmm. But April, April, you know, the December deadline, and if Wilder wins, which we expect him to, for an April fight, makes total sense. I think anything beyond that, I think you're you're risking losing maybe the biggest fight of in the heavyweight division since, I mean, I don't know, Tyson Holyfield, maybe even before that, to be honest. I think it's I think it's yeah. much bigger than that. Like I, I you have to go back a while to actually look at how significant this fight is um but you know uh, we won't we won't realize how significant it is until years after these guys maybe retire but 
um, you know, clearly the longer the wait, the more they're risking this fight never happening. What What if the Wilder Fury fight is absolutely sensational and close, and there's, you know, it's it's a Foreman Lyle thing, and and um, is, you know, it, and you, I mean, it just cries for a rematch. Is Joshua the one who's going to have to wait his turn, John? And set, you know. Oh, if Wilder knocks out Joshua like a Foreman Lyle type. Or the other way around, yeah. I mean, you know, it's just a spectacular uh, fight, and you know, if they're smart, they get him back in the ring again because there's there's so many people that are going to want to see it. Uh, yeah. And, and again, as I said earlier, the vulnerabilities. You, you don't want to you don't want to play with fire too much. The the guy that has this figured out to a T is Eddie Hearn again because as Riz said, and and we said all of us, I think a few weeks ago, he's in such a win win situation. I mean, we might get mad at him that he didn't get the Wilder. Uh, Joshua fight uh, this year, but no matter what happens with the the Wilder Fury fight, he's got a huge fight in 2019. So he yep. he can say whatever he wants, but he's talking out of both sides of his mouth. We know it. And as a businessman and as a promoter, he he's got gold here, you know. Because even mm-hmm. if Wilder loses, he's got Fury and Joshua next year in London. Oh my God, he, eighty thousand yeah. is nothing. He'll get a hundred thousand for that. That'll mm-hmm. sell out in ten minutes. Yeah. Or if maybe last five minutes. So Eddie Hearn is the guy again that is just is doing a phenomenal, not even a phenomenal job. It's almost like he's backed into this in some kind of ways because of what he was doing. I I don't think he's that much of a genius that what happened with uh, him and the Wilder team uh, uh, for in a way it did though. Like I said, he backed into it because he forced Wilder, who's been dying for a big fight, to to take the Fury fight. So. Uh, huge risk. You, you, Travis is right though. You know, you could easily see these guys fighting three times, and especially Dennis. And that was a really good question. If the first fight is a is a is a is a bomber blaster where somebody gets starched in like three rounds, like a, maybe a Hearns Hagler thing, which we could see happening because they both mm-hmm. are such big punchers. Uh, somebody could go down in the first round. Somebody else could go down in the second round. They both could go down. I mean, you know, it's it's just it's crazy. And uh, if they want to make the most money, that would be what the thinking would be. You know, they fight like Travis said. They fight one time in in uh, London, one time in America, and, and then maybe someplace else, maybe back in London. I don't know. It's it, it's a killing to be made for sure financially. And and uh, uh, I hope they get as a hell of a lot more money than Eddie Hearn because they're the one risking everything. But yeah. uh, in a way, like I said, in a way, uh, Hearn has backed into this uh, incredibly and has left the Wilder team very frustrated. And I think the blame that they didn't fight there lays more on Eddie Hearn. I don't think he's that good, like I said, that he could see all this happening. But he just kind of fell into it. And he's smiling all the time now, and you know why. You know, he's he's like that, that smirky little cat in the corner who's grinning because he knows something, and he knows what, what he sees counting, them, uh, counting his money already. So uh, mm-hmm. for boxing, though, when they finally get together, and I agree with Rizzo, too, it has to happen next year. You know, most people are tired of it. I'm tired of it. We're all tired of it. It has to happen next year. But, oh, my God, is it going to be huge. So when it happens, we're going to be thrilled. And it's going to happen. I, I think they will fight. Maybe not three times, but they will at least fight once, and then it will set the set everything for what happens in the future. But, oh, man, you know, nothing. there's nothing more exciting than a heavyweight championship fight, especially when you have two champions. The promotion goes on for months. It's huge. Everybody's talking about it. It won't be like the, the glory days of Muhammad Ali and all that when the world literally stopped when he used to fight. But still... A part of it will, especially in London. So uh, it's it's just, it's great. It's great for the sport and and uh, th- th- those two guys. I mean, they're definitely going to go for it. So it's going to be great to see. How how would you like to be right now, Tyson Fury? Though when Anthony Joshua's team has already given a deadline for a Wilder fight, yeah. Even yeah. though even though Wilder hasn't beat Fury yet, Fury has got to be just this is added motivation. Like he's getting he's the lineal heavyweight champion of the world. Yep. You know, when he lost that title, yep. I guess he went out, which is his fault because he's a little crazy. But how are you right now if you're just sitting there and you're fury listening to all of them talk about a Wilder Joshua fight and you're like, what the heck? I'm getting ready to fight this guy in December. Um, and, they're, and they're talking, they're already overlooking him and he's undefeated by all means. So it's, yep. it definitely makes a real interesting mix because 
the one thing that can derail and mess all this up a little bit, it's it's it is a win win so because if you're the win, that's a huge fight in England for sure. And we all know that's a huge fight. So if you're right, Riz about Eddie Hearn knew this. That's why I said it was a great business move by him because it's hits a win win for him. If Fury wins, though it's a blockbuster fight. If Wilder wins, it's already a blockbuster fight as well. But even the better part of it is like I was saying is Anthony Joshua doesn't have to deal with Tyson Fury because his style is so ridiculous. So I think they're hoping Wilder wins. So he doesn't have to deal with a, a Tyson Fury type of style inside that ring because the, the, the biggest and most explosive matchup is going to be Wilder and Joshua. So Eddie Hearn, it's a win-win, but it's also a little bit of a risk because I don't think they honestly want to fight Tyson Fury. And I said this from the beginning, he's so awkward and just he will give anybody in the world problems with his style, the way he fights. So I think Tyson Fury should be avoided because of his style. But once they get in the ring, guys, Wilder needs to win, that's for dang sure, to set up this Joshua fight. But don't be don't be surprised if Fury spoils something because he's just he's that type of guy. He, he's just yeah. rugged and, and he's a little mental as well, and he's being overlooked right now. And that's the last thing that a guy like Tyson Fury needs is extra motivation because now maybe he will get his stuff together just enough uh, to give Wilder a huge, huge upset. So... Who knows? Tyson Fury is just sitting there. He's got to be smoldering right now because that's all everybody's talking about is Anthony Joshua and Deontay Wilder. And Fury still has to fight Wilder in December. So it's it's a mess, and it could be even messier if Fury upsets that. Travis, let me stick with you on this one because you're the fighter here. Fury, to me, seems supreme, like a supremely confident fighter. Wilder, mm-hmm. to me, seems like a supremely confident fighter. My vibe about Anthony Joshua is he, do, he doesn't really have that same confidence that those other two guys do. I think he's going to be really nervous um, when he finally gets in the ring with either one of those guys, um, maybe even a little overly fearful. I'm not sure that's an unhealthy fear, but I think it's going to be there. Um, he, he doesn't seem to be, be pursuing Wilder or Fury, Fury as aggressively as Wilder and Fury have been pursuing him. Mm-hmm. Um, do, do you feel that at all? Um, or do you, do you think it's just, just Joshua's personality that's just kind of more low-key? Well, I, I think I think it's Joshua's personality because some wise words my dad always told me. He said, he said never be bothered by the guy that talks a lot and, and is very flamboyant and, and – and mouths a lot. He goes, be worried about that guy that's sitting over in the corner not really saying much at all. He goes, that's probably the toughest guy in the room and the scariest guy. It's the guy who's just sitting there all calm, cool, and collected. So I think Anthony Joshua is 100% supremely confident. He just doesn't show it off like a guy like uh, Deontay Wilder or even Tyson Fury. Tyson Fury and Deontay Wilder like to talk a lot. And I'm not saying they're not confident because we all know they for sure are confident and they all have reason to be confident because they're both undefeated. So... I mean, all three of them are undefeated for that matter, but I don't think so. I think as a fighter, Dennis, um, even if we have losses on our record, we go into every single fight genuinely thinking that we can win, genuinely thinking that we are just undefeated in our mind going into a certain fight. So I don't think confidence is lacking in, in any three of those guys for sure, but I do think that Anthony Joshua's confidence is a lot more calm, cool, and collected because you're right, Dennis, by all means, when I watch Joshua, I do look at him like this. He, he almost seems almost even timid a little bit and shy and just a little bit of everything. And, and I know that he's not timid, I mean, because he's a killer. You put him in that ring and he's a killer, you know. He went after Klitschko and put Klitschko away in that 11th round. So he's got that killer instinct. But he just doesn't have that bravado like uh, Deontay Wilder does or, or Tyson Fury. So he doesn't show it off like that. But he's the guy that you got to watch out for, though, because he is that calm and cool and collected guy that's sitting in a corner that you're just like, I don't think I want to mess with that guy. But then the guy over here running his mouth is probably the biggest wuss in, in the whole place, and you're like, yeah, I'll fight this guy. But the calm, cool, quiet guy you want to stay away from because they're, they're the dangerous ones. And I think that is Anthony Joshua. Okay, Riz, you kind of alluded to this earlier. Uh, is, is there anybody behind the big three that, that really catches your eye? When, when we get through these these three guys, is the heavyweight division going to go back into the doldrums? Um, everybody else kind of feels like a second-tier guy right now. Um, Jarrell Miller, undefeated, but he's not creating a lot of buzz yet. Luis Ortiz is an old man already. Um, Joshua's already taking care of Dillian White in seven rounds. Um, nobody else seems interesting. They're all triple-A minor leaguers at best right now. I I actually really like Darrell Miller. I think he's um, uh, he's he got into the sport a little late, but he was you know he did kickboxing, so he he's into combat sports before he got into boxing professionally. And 
you know, I've never seen a 300 pound guy throw, you know, 900, 800 punches, um, in a fight. So he's, he's, he's kind of a very unconventional heavyweight because he's built like a linebacker. I'm not, he can definitely still lose some weight though. Um, but he's, he's, he's a large dude. So, I mean, uh, but uh, you're right. He hasn't really caught anyone's eye because I think his next fight is against Thomas Ad- uh, Adamek, who who hasn't been around since I don't know a really really long time, right? Just a guy who probably shouldn't be fighting even anymore. So uh, Miller definitely needs to get some more quality opponents under him. Actually, the rumor, uh, actually, I think for this fight would have been that Joshua would have been fighting in the summer um, or around this time in maybe in New York against Jerome Miller for his kind of American debut, um, but it didn't turn out that way. But I mean, I think this is, you know, you know, when you're thinking about this and you're thinking about, you know, you're talking about, well, who's left after these guys? I think this is where you're really going to miss a guy like Vladimir Klitschko. People complained about Klitschko for years. He didn't lose for 10 years. And realistically, do you think either Joshua Wilder are going to be undefeated for the next 10 years? Or, you know, yeah. or or even if they have a loss, are they going to come back and dominate for 10 years? And I think, you know, uh, that's why I definitely think people didn't appreciate um, Vladimir in his, in his prime um, because, I mean, he can only be who's in front of him. And, you know, he always, he complained about that himself. That's why he took the Joshua fight, because he had a chance to, you know, even at his advanced age and, and all that, fight a guy who was the, you know, uh, one of the best in the world. And I don't think he really had, um, you know, he really didn't have that in his career. But, um, you know, it, it, it sometimes it makes for some fun fights, right? Sometimes you're going to see upset. Sometimes you're going to see a new player on the scene. Sometimes you're going to see some turnover. Um, but, you know, as I think the one thing... That Vladimir, I wouldn't say he lacked, but it was just not in his DNA, was creating entertaining fights. I guess for Vladimir, you know, he was very methodical. He understood that he could, if he could jab his way for 12 rounds and win, he didn't see any reason not to. Uh, where I think the new crop of heavyweights may not be as technically sound and may lose more, but I think we're going to get more entertaining fights out of it. And I think if we're going to see more entertaining fights, people are going to watch. Um, we might not see legacy-defining. This might not be a legacy-defining era. Um, in terms of, you know, who's best heavyweights of all time. But I think you'll see, you might see an entertaining era. And I think that's, that's, that's well and good. And, I, and if you look at history, that's kind of been the way, the, the way the pattern has been, right? I mean, with the exception of, you know, Ali, Frazier, and Foreman, um, that kind of had a bit of both. Um, when Larry Holmes was on the scene, Larry Holmes was a very un, uh, underappreciated fighter. Larry Holmes, same thing, dominated for years. Some people said against, you know, more lackluster opposition. Um, and then when he left, that's when that's when the Tysons and Holyfields and 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 Bo arrived on the scene. And then obviously after that era, then here comes Vladimir. So it seems that's kind of been the the pattern um, boxing has went, especially in heavyweight division. You have a kind of maybe an underappreciated quality fighter, and then you kind of have the entertaining entertaining guys. Um, so I think you might see that here. I think that's what. So uh, even if Joshua Wilder loses, I don't think this could be the end of them. I think that was kind of the case with the with the last. What you know more the Vladimir era it was pretty much Vladimir and everyone else. Um, where in this in this scenario, I don't think that's the case. I think you're going to see um, you're going to see entertaining fights. You know, just it, Fury might kind of have one door out of you know uh, into retirement, but uh, that's what we talked about Joshua and Joshua and Wilder. You know, one of these guys could lose, come back and lose against another fighter, but still beat you know each other down the line. And I think that's what makes you know this idea of. I think boxing tries to make this, you know, one big fight always. Why do that when you can have a great fight and do it over and over and over again? Because that's people are going to remember that more. Um, you know, instead of thinking, instead of making a Super Bowl out of it, why not make it a, you know, almost like a turn into like a best of seven series, right? And that's what people are going to remember more. And except the difference is in boxing, you know, you win, you win one way, you know, good enough. You're not going to need anything more, right? If if Joshua blows out Wilder in the first round, there's not going to be a demand for the rematch. But I think there's potential to be, um, you know, uh, I think there's potential to be some of the best, most entertaining fights in heavyweight history. I think that, I think the fight has that potential. And if it does, it's not about legacy and who's and you know how where Joshua ranks as the greatest heavyweight of all time. But he'll remember it as an entertaining fighter, um, and Wilder remembered as a great entertaining fighter. And we'll be talking about one of the best fights ever. And I think that's the potential this fight has. And that's why rushing, you know, waiting to make it is a, is a crucial mistake. It's just, a, you know, a mistake that could haunt, uh, haunt boxing and heavyweight yeah. boxing and both these fighters for just years. And, uh, you know, I, I doesn't seem like, especially Joshua doesn't seem like he's you know, that kind of guy. He, he, I don't think he's going to, he's going to be, he's going to be a guy who loses sleep if he doesn't fight the best. 
um, where I think certain fighters are content not to. I think there's, you know, there's obviously a promotion at play and all that, but um, I, I say this, I'm a lot more confident in a Joshua Wilder fight happening in April ever was about a Canelo Golovkin fight happening within six months or a year when we thought it would, mm-hmm. right? Or a Mayweather Pacquiao. So I think that's, I think we're moving in the right direction, maybe a little slower than we wanted to. This is the Ringside Boxing Show from Monterey, California. I'm Dennis Taylor. We're talking to our expert analyst, Travis Hartman, Rizwan Zahid, John J. Responti. Uh, our British correspondent's coming up shortly, and uh, also our... Uh, our great uh, historian, Christopher James Shelton, who's going to talk to us. Uh, he's going to take us in the way back machine again, um, like only he can. Uh, okay, uh, can anybody explain to me why Canelo wants to fight again in December? And I, I'm, I'm glad he does. That's old school. We just don't see it very often anymore. But, man, I'm really surprised, John. Um, in the position he's in, it seems like a really high-risk, low-reward uh situation to take on somebody like David Lemieux who's got that that huge puncher's chance or Jamal Charlo who's a really talented young lion um rather than turn to a the the Golovkin uh trilogy before GGG gets another year year older um what's Canelo thinking right now why does he want to fight in December John Are you there we we lose John I guess we lost John, man. Uh, what are you thinking, Travis? Um, you know, honestly, I think this is just posturing. I, I, I truly don't believe he's going to fight in December. Really? Um, I believe that. I, I really, I just, I don't see it happening. But if he does, you know, good for him because the Mexican fans. If he does do that, it's going to really show that he's, he's definitely, um, definitely there for the Mexican fans again because the Mexican fans wanted to see people fight. I mean, we had Chavez fighting. It seemed like every other week. I mean, that's why he had, you know, over 100 pro fights. So if Canelo takes this fight in December, holy cannoli, like I'm going to give him so much respect. It's going to be re- mm-hmm. it's going to be out of this world respect because we all know that uh, um, a trilogy with Triple G wasn't going to happen until next year anyways. That was just regardless. Everybody knew that there was going to be a blockbuster fight in May. That's the Mexican independence, you know, Cinco de Mayo. Not the Mexican independence, but it was Cinco de Mayo weekend. Mm-hmm. So we knew that if they were going to do a trilogy, it was going to be in May anyway. So if Canelo decides to take one more fight in December before that, I I mean, more props to him, Dennis. That's, I mean, that really is phenomenal. And Canelo is really coming around trying to, to please his fans. But on the flip side, I think it's complete posturing. I do not think that they're going to do it. I think they're just promoting, and I think this is Oscar Del Hoya talking a little more than anything, and I, I truly don't believe they will. But if it does end up being David Lemieux, I don't think he'll have any problem. I think he might even stop David Lemieux in about seven or eight rounds, to be completely honest. So maybe that's why they're kind of coming out saying that he'll do it. But I don't think it'll happen. I would, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say I'm 90% sure that Canelo will not fight in December, and that's just my opinion, but I just don't think he will. Riz, what do you think about that? And and there's no way he'd fight Charlo on short notice, right? On, on in December. Oh, absolutely not. I think um, I think they're gonna look at. I think there's a couple of reasons. Number one, Travis alluded to it: damage control. I think he's trying to win back some fans. I think there's still so many fans that are just completely against him. Um, and I think the other thing is he only fought he only fought once this year. I think he wants some money, <laughs> right? That doesn't hurt, especially if he can fight you know a guy like David Lemieux, who's probably pretty confident in beating. Um, the other thing is, where's the fight going to happen? Because he's a free agent right now. Bob Arum has said he's more than willing to kind of get um, Canelo and Golovkin on ESPN. And you've got to think that ESPN is knocking on the door right now to try to get Canelo, um, you know, on their broadcast. Um, and that could be a complete, game, you know, game changer in terms of his future opponents and who, and, you know, if he's going to end up fighting a Danny Jacobs or, or any of those kind of guys. You know, zone's kind of the same idea. So I think... I think Travis is partially right. I think it could be posturing. Um, seems like he's interested in fighting, but he also said it depends on what the doctors says about the cut. Um, and I think it's also kind of trying to gauge where the market is for Canelo um, because it doesn't seem. It seems like HBO's. It seems like HBO's pretty much done, right? It's just they, you know, they're losing fighters constantly. Yeah, and you, you, you can't. You're not gonna. If you're gonna have Kevin Farmer as your pay-per-view headliner, you're gonna have a problem. Um, and I think that's kind of the boat they're in right now. So I think I think part of it's also just gauging where Canelo is. Um, how much money they can get for each of his fights, where where are they going to put those fights. I think it's all those kind of things right now because I don't think they want to deal with that in May. I think they want to have all those, um, you know, those uh, those kinks out of the way for for uh, for whoever he ends up fighting in May. Um, where December, I think they, you know, we can put on a good fight. We can, 
you know, put it on a put it on a respectable card, or let's see if we put it on ESPN. They're, they're, I think it's more just it's almost like a, it's almost it's almost like a training camp. It's almost like it's almost like they're um, you know a tune up for the promotion team and and people in marketing, and just to see where you know Canelo's market actually is from a financial standpoint and where he's going to end up fighting, which broadcast, which network, and you know are they going to go to the zone? Does it make sense to, for them to do streaming if they're going to um, you know if they're targeting more Mexican uh, Mexican fans, or are they trying to hit an international audience? And because of that, does does something with the zone make more? You know what I mean? So I think there's there's they're working on a few things, and I think that's what they're testing more than just Canelo coming back to fight. There's there's a lot more intricacies at play than that comes out of just um, Canelo, you know, getting back into the ring. I think there's a lot more to it than that. Uh, last one for you guys, and and either one of you or both of you. Um, What's what's the future for Billy Joe Saunders? Where where does he fit in this? And you know, in in light of the kind of personality that's emerging in him, um, are are you optimistic that he's that he's someday going to rule this division? I I, I think. Go ahead, Travis. Go ahead. Go, Travis. Yeah, I, I think that, I think that he does. I think he has the. I think he has the style. To, to rule division longevity wise because he's such a, a clean slick boxer and, and he doesn't make a lot of damage, doesn't take a lot of punches. So I mean as we were talking earlier, we seen somebody like Vladimir Klitschko uh did the same thing. He ruled the division for ten or eleven years because he didn't take a lot of damage and he boxed and it was always it wasn't always most exciting but he used his jab a lot, stayed away. So I can see something like that in Billy Joe Saunders because he is that type of fighter. Um will that happen? I'm not sure because he it seems like he's having some some uh out of the ring problems, uh, some attitude yep. problems now, some, and all of that's kind of coming to light a little bit. So, when there's that many distractions, it's very, very, very hard to to live a successful and superstar type of career. Floyd Mayweather is the exception to that rule because obviously we know he was just turmoil, and somehow he still ended up being able to just be great. But he's the exception; he's not the rule, that's for sure. So we're not going to see that again, I don't think. And I don't think Billy Joe Saunders is that talented as Mayweather, but. I do think he's extremely and superbly talented, guys, and I said it, that if he fought Canelo or Triple G, that I think Billy Joe Saunders is just as good a shot as beating any one of those guys um, as, on any given day just because of his style, how fast he is, how much he moves. I really think that he's got a really good style and he's really fast, but will those fights ever happen? We don't know because some off the or out of the, out of the ring you know, debacles can hold him back for sure. But I think Billy Joe Saunders... To answer the question 100%, Dennis, I think he has the style, yes, to rule that division for a lengthy amount of time. Okay, hey, that's Travis Travis Hartman, Rizwan Zahid, John J. Responti. Uh, they've all got stuff to do today, so we're going to let them uh, get to it. Thanks, guys. Great stuff, as always, and we'll talk to you next week. Thanks a lot. Thank you, guys. All right, uh, we're going to let our local fans in, here in Central California know that our undefeated featherweight uh, Ruben Villa the Fourth is going to be fighting Saturday, October 13th, in Salinas, California, a little indoor soccer venue called the Storm House, which is an absolutely great place to watch boxing. Ruben's going to try and move to 14 and 0 on the show that night, um, which is co-promoted by Thompson Boxing and Banner Promotions. Tickets for that show are going to go lightning fast. They sold out in a big hurry the last time Ruben fought in Salinas. So watch the Banner Promotions website for information on that. Doors are going to open at 4 p.m. on October 13th, and the first fight will happen at 6. Uh, The Thompson Boxing website also is going to stream that show live uh, with Beto Duran and Steve Kim providing the commentary. Paul McLaughlin, our British correspondent, is up next. And then Christopher James Shelton, our boxing historian, is going to close today's show with some more amazing tales from the earliest days of boxing. Don't go away. We'll be back in one minute. You're listening to the Ringside Boxing Show, the hottest, sweatiest show on West Coast Radio. (laughs) What are you doing? Hi, I'm Dennis Taylor, host of the Ringside Boxing Show, where since 2008 we have been continuously sponsored by Garcia Boxing, the first family of the sweet science on California's beautiful Central Coast. Trainers Max and Sam Garcia and ring strategist Dean Hamilton are regarded among the most knowledgeable in the game. And Kathy Garcia, who manages all Garcia Boxing fighters, is renowned for her integrity and career guidance 
having taken two boxers to number one world rankings. Together they comprise one of the most respected teams in the sport. Learn more by calling 831-261-3214 or send them an email at GarciaBoxing25 at AOL.com. Hi there, it's Paul McLaughlin with your weekly roundup of everything going on in the UK boxing scene. Well, a great night at Wembley last night. Anthony Joshua defended his world heavyweight titles with a devastating knockout of Alexander Povetkin after overcoming an early onslaught from the Russian. The British star blasted Povetkin to the canvas with a brutal assault in the seventh round and then floored the WBA mandatory challenger again to signal a sudden and dramatic ending to his 22nd professional victory. A straight right hand sent shockwaves through the legs of Povetkin and a left hook followed by a right sent him crashing to the canvas. Povetkin clambered upwards in a daze and Joshua delivered a succession of crunching shots to seal a stunning triumph. Alexander Povetkin is a very tough challenger. He proved that tonight with good left hooks, good counter punches. But I come in here to have fun, do what I've been working on in the gym and give it my best. I realised he was strong to the head but I know that he was weak to the body. So I, instead of jabbing to the head, I was just switching it up. And every jab takes a second of breath out of you, so it slows him down. It could have took seven, maybe nine, maybe 12 rounds to get him out of there, but the ultimate goal was to be victorious tonight. So who's next for Joshua? Will it be the victor of Wilder versus Fury? Or will it be Dillian White? Who knows? Elsewhere, not such a good night for David Price, who retired on his stool after four punishing rounds against Sergei Kuzmin. The Liverpool heavyweight was boxing well against his unbeaten Russian visitor, and the conclusion silenced the considerable support he had enjoyed at the National Stadium. An injured bicep was the cause of Price's withdrawal, and it represents a second consecutive stoppage defeat, having been knocked out by Povetkin on the undercard of Joseph Parker and Anthony Joshua. You know, nothing's changed really, it's just another, it's another loss, but the way I'm beating, you know, I was coming off a, a, a bad knockout defeat and I felt I carried myself well enough in there against a, a dangerous opponent, so, you know, I can see positives from it, but it's just, just disappointing again, just once again, a little frustrating. Elsewhere, Lawrence O'Coley claimed the British Cruiserweight title despite receiving three point deductions in an ugly unanimous decision win over Matty Askin. The 25 year old Hackney man was fortunate to preserve his unbeaten record as he repeatedly tested the patience of referee Victor Lachlan on the way to an underwhelming victory. And also, good news for Luke Campbell, who masterfully outpointed Ivan Mendy to avenge his 2015 defeat and set up a shot at the WBC world title. The whole lightweight working with Shane McGuigan in his corner for the first time promised a much improved performance from the loss three years ago and he delivered a clinical display at Wembley. Working behind a southpaw stance, Campbell's skill overwhelmed the Frenchman's come forward pressure throughout this WBC final eliminator before scores of 119 to 109. 118 to 111 and 116 to 112 confirmed a crucial win. Right, that's your lot from me. Still got some cracking fights to come forward. Smith Groves is on its way. I'm backing Smith on that. But in the meantime, I'm going to get back to the studio. Gloves up and protect yourselves at all times. Back to you guys. Oh boy, is this great! I'm Dennis Taylor, co-author of the Amazon bestseller Intimate Warfare, the true story of the Arturo Gatti and Mickey Ward boxing trilogy. You know, writing this book was a labor of love for John J. Responti and myself. We enjoyed every minute of the process and considered it a privilege to tell the tale of one of the most electrifying boxing trilogies in the history of this sport. Intimate Warfare traces the collision course of Arturo Gatti and Mickey Ward from their earliest days through their three epic fights as well as the aftermath of this great rivalry which culminated in one of the greatest friendships in boxing. Intimate Warfare has received a four and a half star rating from readers and was endorsed by Hall of Famers Harold Letterman and Joe Cortez and two-time trainer of the year Virgil Hunter. Our foreword was written by Ray Boom Boom Mancini, another one of the greatest blood and guts fighters of our time. Get your copy today at Amazon.com. 
Welcome back to the Ringside Boxing Show on the Grueling Crew Sports Network, where today we wanted to reconnect with our historian, the inimitable Christopher James Shelton, who once again is going to take us back in time uh, to some of the earliest days of the sweet science and tell us about a fighter named Peter Mayer, a world heavyweight champion who fought in the 1800s and into the early 1900s. Wikipedia said he had a record of 142 and 28 with six draws, and he knocked out 107 of those those opponents, so he had a punch. Um, he fought from middleweight to heavyweight, and we're going to find out right now why Peter Mayer caught the interest of Christopher Shelton. Chris, welcome back, my friend. You're battling some health issues right now and uh, biting through some pain, and we appreciate you sucking it up and uh, for a few minutes and uh, joining us again today on the Ringside Boxing Show. Well, thank you. I'm glad to be here, and yes, I've surgery next week and been in a lot of pain, but I, I try to make that like part of the Peter Mayer story because he's an immigrant. You're coming here facing a lot of different kinds of people you don't know and trying to do the best you can. People don't like you because you're Irish or they don't like you because you're just not from America. So I try to make that being in pain and sort of having to deal with it the best you can part of the story. <laughs> there you go. Uh, okay, well, well, fill us in on the backstory of Peter Mayer. Who, who was this guy and where was he from? Well, he fought actually, probably at his peak, he fought a little under six foot at 180 pounds, which, you know, is a, is a healthy sized guy for his day, but not quite what we think of a heavyweight today. At a hard punch, he's from Ireland, and he claimed, if nothing else, to be the Irish heavyweight champion in 1890. Now, these things are always, you're a little unsure what's going on in Europe with their with their claims, but nonetheless, you know, he, he attention right away fighting in the Northeast. And um, and built up his reputation by taking on a couple high profile guys and and if which we'll get into was he actually heavyweight champion or not which is the interesting part of me for the story because boxing historians have a way of playing with these facts so much and they're, they're not like baseball stories baseball stories are very exact it comes out one way or the other you know it doesn't matter what you want while boxing historians tend to be fans and they sort of just fit everything into the puzzle pieces like a square block into a circle block whether it fits or not. And and so hopefully we're going to try to tell the truth of whether this guy is deserving to be remembered, which he is enough that we're doing an interview, and was he ever heavyweight champion, which I guess we'll discuss. Well, yeah, I mean, it's I guess it's been generally accepted through my uh, lifetime that uh, Floyd Patterson was the first heavyweight to regain the championship. Um, where, where's the disconnect between Floyd Patterson and, and what you know about Peter Mayer? Yes, exactly. I, you know, I know that is the claim. The claim is that Floyd Patterson is the first person to regain the heavyweight championship. But if that's true, it means Peter Mayer was never heavyweight champion. You can't have both. What you had in boxing was a horrible scandal. It's even worse than it was in 1896, I believe, in December, involving Wyatt Earp, which we'll get into that in just a minute. But that, um, with, at least with the 1919 White Sox throwing the World Series or whatever their involvement and stuff, there's no question Cincinnati won. Cincinnati wasn't part of a fraud. So, hey, who won the World Series that year? It was Cincinnati. That's clear. But yet a heavyweight bout that was so um, scandalous that nobody was declared the victor. Only Bob Fitzsimmons was the heavyweight champion at the time. And it, he lost his title. But the guy that beat him, Tom Sharkey, I'll get to that in just a moment, um, nobody would allow him to be champion because everybody knew it was a fraud. So now Bob Fitzsimmons eventually was able to fight again and reclaim the championship. So he's the first heavyweight champion to reclaim the championship. But if you deny him that and say it's a Floyd Patterson, well, then Peter Mayer was never champion, even though he wasn't involved in a fraud. So if this sounds complicated to the audience, we'll get through it. So it'll hopefully make sense. Um, Peter Mayer's breakthrough fight in in America was against a former colored heavyweight champion, and that's what they called him back then, colored heavyweight champion, George Godfrey. Who you? Yeah. Um, tell us about George Godfrey. Who was who he, and, and what happened when he fought Peter Mayer? Well, George Godfrey was the best uh, black heavyweight of the, of the uh, 1880s, and he was the first person to really put pressure on John L. Sullivan for a unified title fight, which 
Sullivan originally agreed to do, and then he pulled away from it. And so Godfrey really brought attention that, you know what, the, it's unfair to keep the black heavyweights from fighting for this unified title, or you've got to call their own champion, not like a, like the minor leagues, but the, at the time the English were the ones who were using the term the colored heavyweight champion with a U. Um, eventually in the 1890s, they switched it to an American spelling and the colored championship without the U. But Godfrey put a lot of pressure that a black heavyweight is just as good, if not better, than a white heavyweight, but by the time he fought Mayer, it was the early 1890s, and he was still a huge draw and still a very successful bi fighter, but he lost his title to Peter Jackson, and um, uh, he fought Mayer, and Mayer scored a sixth-round knockout, which was a little unusual in the sense that John O'Sullivan was there, and Sullivan was rooting very openly for the Irishman, uh, Mayer, so when the referee counted to six with Godfrey on the ground, Sullivan just raced into the ring, and everybody raced into the ring before the guy got a 10 count. Wow. Though the, re the referee stopped his count and tried to wave people away from Godfrey and then finished it to 10. So it's a legitimate knockout, but, it, but some people felt it was just a tiny bit unfair that Godfrey didn't get his full 10 seconds, though um, at this point Mayer is young and hungry, and Godfrey is not at the end of his career, but he's certainly on the past his prime. Okay, so James Corbett uh, was the uh, was an undefeated heavyweight champion, and he retired. And when he did, uh, it sounds like he personally tapped Peter Mayer to fight this guy Steve O'Donnell for the vacant title. How come Corbett deemed these two guys worthy of that title fight? He deemed Corbett deemed them worthy because they're of Irish descent. <laughs> he said, you know, oh. I'm I'm giving this up only for an Irishman. Now, even at that time, the person that people felt were the most legitimate, and the second, the first legitimate person was Bob Fitzsimmons, who was the former middleweight champion, who admitted he took a dive in a title fight in Australia, and because he needed the money, so he wasn't exactly an angel too. But um, but anyway, at this time, people really wanted to see him fight Corbett, and Corbett wasn't fighting anybody. He was interested in his acting career, so Corbett finally decided to retire. He openly retired. He went to the fight and tapped Steve O'Donnell, who was a frequent soaring partner of John L. Sullivan and Peter Mayer, an Irishman, legit, um, to fight, and whoever won, in, in Corbett's mind, it would stay in the hands of an Irishman. Um, and, uh, and he was there at the fight. He, they said he practically kissed Mayer when Mayer won. It's very unusual. I don't know. But anyway, um, Corbett said, you know, from now on, you're the heavyweight champion. I mean, he retired, was there at the fight, and announced Mayer as his um, you know, successor. And unfortunately, it's just when it fell out of the hands of an Irishman that Corbett decided um, he didn't want to give up his title. Again. I mean, he already gave it up, um, and that's the thing. Now Peter Mayer is heavyweight champion. He's legitimately heavyweight champion because Corbett retired. He's at the fight. He practically kissed Mayer and said, you are the new heavyweight champion. So I don't know how Peter Mayer's not the heavyweight champion at that point. Okay, so his first title defense was against the middleweight champ that you just talked about, uh, Bob Fitzsimmons, right? Yes, and Bob Fitzsimmons was probably the person that was most legitimately looked on as worthy of a fight, and that Corbett kept avoiding him. And probably the second person in line was a great boxer of Jewish descent who used to read the books of Danny Mendoza. His dad was an eccentric publisher named Joe Kowinski. So those guys were really ahead of both Mayer and O'Donnell um, as far as worthiness of a, of a title fight. So to give Mayer credit... Mayer did take on Fitzsimmons to sort of legitimize his title. They went to the Texas border. Um, it was actually in Mexico. And there were something like 30, 30 Texas guards. There's only 200 people at the fight, and they're paying $20 a piece. It's a lot of money for wow. 1896. Yeah. Um, and, have, and having to travel to get to this obscure place to do this. Um, so there's only 200 people that are paying this $20 a piece, but meanwhile, they had at least 30 Texas guards and over 200 military personnel from Mexico. There were more guards at the fight than patrons of the fight, um, but um, Fitzsimmons easily dominated it and, and knocked out Mayer in one round. It was another. Mayer knocked out Steve O'Donnell, incidentally, in one round, knocked him down three times to claim the title, and now Fitzsimmons had legitimately won the title. You know, Mayor Corbett gave it off to Mayor, and then Corbett got upset because he didn't want he didn't like Bob Fitzsimmons, and he didn't want a non-Irishman to have the title. But the reality is, Bob Fitzsimmons is now the heavyweight champion, legitimately. Okay, so now uh, his, uh, I guess, the dream fight at that point becomes uh, Bob Fitzsimmons against Jewish Joe Kowinski, right? Yes, that would have been the ideal fight because. 
Um, they're both very good boxers. Um, they could take a punch and they could throw a, I mean, especially if it's Simmons could throw a punch. Quinsky has kind of an ambush style a little bit, but, but certainly that was going to be the high profile fight. There are some, some historians of, um, who are Jewish who somehow believe Quinsky was kept from the, from the title because he was Jewish, which just isn't true. Quinsky is a real popular guy. And in fact, he's, he's really referenced as being Jewish in the midst of these fights, it was really more after his career who's sort of looked upon, you know, in a certain way. But anyway, that would have been the dream fight. And then all Quinsky had to do was defeat Peter Mayer. Now, Mayer's a, a bigger guy than Quinsky. Quinsky's about 5'11 and 175 pounds. Looks like a skinny basketball player, but a real smart boxer. He fought heavyweights really well. Both uh, James Jeffries, whom he got a draw from and, and nearly – broke his jaw, Je- Jeffrey said, he-, he hit me harder than anybody I ever got hit by. And Jack Johnson later said when he fought him, this guy hit me harder than anybody because what, what Quinsky would do is just left jab after left jab after left jab at different angles, very strange angles. So you just keep getting hit by it, the body and the chin, and then you start trying to think you're going to deflect it, and you're not even paying attention to his right. Cause it might as well be disabled. He doesn't use it. And then he's just winding up and waiting for it, and pow, hit you with it. And he did it to Mayer, uh, and he was leading Mayer for the first five rounds, though Quinsky did get knocked down once, and uh, the fans started getting after Quinsky. They started booing him and hissing him because they thought he was avoiding Mayer, not not really engaging. And then Quinsky, as he could sometimes do, got stupid and decided he was going to knock out Mayer and try to mix it up with him, and Mayer knocked him out. That ended the dream fight of Quinsky versus Fitzsimmons for the title, although Quinsky's fame would later kick in because of, uh, of his fight against Jack Johnson later on. Okay, so next comes what was considered the greatest scandal in the history of the heavyweight division, and you alluded to this earlier. It involved the heavyweight champion Bob Fitzsimmons and the challenger Tom Sharkey, who's you know probably your all-time favorite fighter, <laughs> right? <laughs> he's, a, he's, an all-time, referee, he's an all-time villain. I'll say that all-time villain, and also the referee Wyatt Earp, who of course was. Uh, the legendary Wild West Marshal and, and known as a gunfighter. What was the scandal and what kind of crisis did it cause in the sport? And, and also, how did boxing survive the crisis? Well, it, it, it like I said, it, it, unfortunately, it was a tremendous scandal, and it was involving Wyatt Earp, the gunfighter of the OK Corral, which left uh, two McClary brothers dead and a 16-year-old Billy Clanton dead. Um, and then Wyatt went on to murder more people when he was trying to chase out of Arizona but um, with his buddy Doc Holliday. sounds all surreal, but it's all true. But anyway, he, he decided to get – his best friend was a Bad uh, Masterson, and Bad Masterson was heavily involved in the boxing scene, and, and I don't know what was going on. I don't know why Bad Masterson liked Wyatt Earp so much because Masterson was a much more honest guy. But anyway, he somehow got involved that Wyatt Earp could be the referee for this title fight, even though Wyatt Earp really had no experience as a referee. And in fact – they decided to throw the fight, which, which Bob Fitzsimmons knew. He knew this thing was rigged against him from day one and still decided to go through with it because there was a huge crowd in San Francisco, 10,000 people. And it just felt that he was going to try to win despite this thing being rigged against him. And Tom Sharkey was part of this fraud. Going into the fight, Sharkey was actually fairly popular. He had come from Honolulu, so it's kind of interesting. There was, a, there was a boxing scene from Honolulu. He was an American sure. military person. Wow. And... Um, and uh, then he got a high-profile fight against James Corbett, who had come out of retirement but was not the champion anymore. So this was a non-championship fight. And Sharkey with his antics, because Corbett had a way of cheating, but so Sharkey's antics cheating with Corbett, he was grabbing him and throwing him to the ground and wrestling him hard, and the fans just loved it. So it gave Sharkey sort of a legitimate, not only victory, but sort of a, a popular win and gave him this opportunity against Bob Fitzsimmons. But very quickly, Bob Fitzsimmons' camp learned that this thing was rigged against him. So Fitzsimmons really made a fool out of Sharkey in the ring. You know, Fitzsimmons the heavyweight champion. He was, he was outboxing uh, Mayer, knocking him to the ground, sometimes helping him up. He knocked Mayer – I mean, not Mayer, Sharkey. knocked him um, Knocked down Sharkey. Sharkey and then helped Sharkey back up to the ground and then just – easily outboxed him and then finally in the eighth round he landed a body punch and and this time um sharky went down and wouldn't get up he kept rising in agony like he he looked like a soccer player from brazil the world cup (laughs) he just kept rolling around on the ground and um uh fitzsimmons was looking like you know what i do and 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 not at no point of these other knockdowns did white earp even offer a count that's how little he knew about boxing and at that point white earp simply disqualified fitzsimmons and said, you know, you lost the title, the new champions, Tom Sharkey, and the crowd went nuts. Everyone thinks that Wyatt Earp is this tough guy who walked in there with a gun and scared everyone. First of all, 
he was the one scared. Uh, Wyatt Earp found out a boxing mob, and incidentally, they never forgave him. He had to he had to hide from this rest of the rest of his life. He had to run from the stadium from everyone ready to kill him oh. over this fraud, and that everyone knew Fitzsimmons wanted to fight, but but technically, if you're disqualified. You know, you've lost, but nobody was going to give it to Sharky because everybody knew. And he admitted, these stupid idiots went to court to get their money because uh, 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 Fitzsimmons' people put a, a stop on the payment at the bank saying, you know what, there's a fraud involved. So Sharky couldn't get his money originally. So they sued everybody. And then the Los Angeles loved it, the district attorney's office, because now you've put on record everybody cheating and breaking the law. He said, I'm just going to arrest all of you, and, and none of you are going to get a thing because you're breaking the law. So they were total idiots about it. It. But meanwhile, what do you do about this, this fraud? And the decision was made, and it's just very arbitrary, though it's probably the right thing to do, um, is that we're not going to call Sharky the champion since he committed fraud, but I guess Fitzsimmons isn't the champion, I guess. Uh, so now they went back to James Corbett, and Corbett was still undefeated. He was anxious to get back his title because whatever was going on with his acting, he was famous as a heavyweight champion. So Corbett says, I will be heavyweight champion again. I will agree to fight Bob Fitzsimmons, which will rectify everything. And then the boxing world decided, okay, well, the best thing to do is to sort of say uh, Corbett never retired, even though he did. And that, therefore, he never gave up the championship. Therefore, Bob Fitzsimmons was never champion. But again, the problem with that is then it means Peter Mayer was never the champion ever. And, and he'd be the only gloved Irish champion, heavyweight champion. And you just can't take that away from Mayer because Mayer didn't do anything wrong. Um, this is all wide open and Tom Sharkey and his managers – and somehow it really screwed up Peter Mayer's legacy. And that's why when you see Floyd Patterson fight, they say, uh, oh, he's the first person to reclaim the championship. It's like erasing a part of history for the sake of what do you do when you have a title fight and you don't want to declare anybody the victor. Okay, so Corbett comes out of retirement undefeated, and he, he's going to fight Bob Fitzsimmons, right? Yes, he, that was part of the agreement was, look, Fitzsimmons was robbed. It actually helped Fitzsimmons. There's there's a ebb and flow to people being popular, and Fitzsimmons had to face what a lot of people face. He wasn't popular at all, and Sharky was very popular going into their title fight, but after the fraud had occurred, now Sharky became very unpopular for a while, very unpopular, and now people like Bob Fitzsimmons because they felt sorry for him that, hey, you know, you robbed him of his title. Um, uh, okay, so what happened in the fight? When, well, finally, they, they, they did fight um, uh, Corbett and uh, undefeated Corbett versus Bob Fitzsimmons. It's actually on film. They've tried to do the best to keep it together. And, and Corbett did score you know, an early knockdown on the sixth round with, uh, against uh, Fitzsimmons. But Fitzsimmons in the 14th round landed a hell of a body shot. And at the time, you could stand over the guy and hit him the minute he moved. moved um, you know, to his feet, but but Corbett was winded. He had had the wind completely knocked out of him, and you could see Corbett's literally as the count is going on one, two, three, and Fitzsimmons hovering over him with the referee. Corbett's crawling desperately, trying to get to the ropes and pull himself back to his feet. It's actually very dramatic, and that uh, Corbett couldn't do it. He couldn't make it to ten, and that's it. Counted out, knocked out, and now Bob Fitzsimmons is champion again. Not for the first time. But, again, with the scandal, um, it affected – I don't think Bob Fitzsimmons really cares whether he's a two-time champion or, or that at least he's champion again. But it affects Peter Mayer's legacy. But anyway, at this point, Bob Fitzsimmons is now legitimately the unified champion, though uh, he would have fought uh, a, P a Peter Jackson or a black heavyweight or Bob Armstrong at that time, but he just never did. Okay, so let, let me give you an opening now to – talk about one of your favorite subjects, which is Tom Sharkey, who you call the most corrupt and most hated boxer of his time. Who was this guy, and how, how come he's worthy of those labels for you? Well, he's, he's, he's worthy of it in the sense that the New York Times wrote a really blistering editorial about Sharkey. It was just his behavior. He was, a, you know, he was kind of a working man in the sense that people identified with me, even though he was from the military. He fought at a Honolulu. Very strange to, to come from that world. But that he did fight dirty, and he did fight in the 1890s at a time where um, Americans identified him as sort of a, a tough SOB, but a dishonest one. And this was 
when he got around to fighting Nair, which we'll talk about, this is still at a period where he was extremely unpopular because that he, you know, he's part of a scandal to to cheat somebody out of the heavyweight title, and he wasn't forgiven easily for that. And then an incident with Joe Kowinski and called Kowinski the best fighter he ever took on. Kowinski actually helped him with teaching him boxing, but when he had a legitimate fight, um, he tackled Kowinski to the ground and began choking him openly in front of people. <laughs> so that oh, man. exactly helped Sharky's reputation. And before we get to the mayor situation where he was very unpopular at this time, he eventually turned it around. He kept claiming he was heavyweight champion because of what happened involving Fitzsimmons, but nobody believed him. He kept doing that years and years after the fight, and uh, eventually he did reclaim his reputation because he fought James Jeffries twice. and all. He was knocked down once, but he lasted 45 rounds with James Jeffries, and people thought, well, this is a tough son of a bitch. And so he regained his popularity based on his two losses against James Jeffries and then opened up his own bar and, and started hiring 14-year-old hookers and uh, <laughs> ran into bankruptcy and managed to get himself in trouble all over again. But but anyway, at the time he was going to face um, Mayer, he was definitely the most unpopular guy in boxing due to choking Quinsky and being actively involved in a fraud against Bob Fitzsimmons. Okay, so what happened when Sharky fought Peter Mayer? Well, as unfair as it is, Sharky still was undefeated with his with his craziness and antics, and uh, and Mayer just completely dominated him. I mean, it's easy to, it's easy to look at Mayer as mostly just an offensive guy because because that's really what he was. He wasn't the most clever of boxers, but he was he was clearly with the experience he had, he was easily outclassing Sharky for six rounds, just outboxing him, knocking him around. Sharky's barely holding on, and so the bell ends, you know, after the sixth round. And Mayer's starting to walk back to his corner, and Sharky just comes up from behind and smashes him three times to the head. Oh, my God. Um, a, a typical Tom Sharky kind of thing to do. And the crowd gets all riled up and stuff because it's so dishonest. And so the, not only does the referee stop the fight, but the police jump into the ring and arrest both the guys for engaging in a prize fight. And um, the referee calls it a draw. So Sharky, one more time, gets away with something really horrible, which did not help his reputation, but at the same time managed to remain undefeated in his official record. So they both go to jail? They both go to jail, and they're... Um, the, the, I think the attorney, the, the, the district attorney said, come on, these are two big guys, and I saw the fight. They're slugging each other out. They are trying to hurt each other. Sharky hit this guy three times to the back of the head. If this isn't a prize fight, then there's no such thing as a prize fight. Um, and then the judge, he, he held him in jail overnight and decided that was enough, and his decision was that, yes, they were technically breaking the law and engaging in a prize fight, but they couldn't have done this if it went not for all these fans who wanted to see it and that these two guys are adults and seem to know what they were doing. I mean, it, 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 that was very common to arrest the pugilists and then decide to let them go the next day, pretending it wasn't a prize fight. In this case, the judge actually ruled they were engaged in a prize fight. They were doing something illegal, but they couldn't have done it or wouldn't have done it if it wasn't for all these people paying money to see them do it, and that these two guys knew what they were doing when they stepped into the ring with each other. And, of course, for Sharky, it all works out great because he's getting his ass kicked uh, again and somehow comes out of it undefeated, even though all he did was hit a guy three – rabbit punched him, hit him three times in the back of the head while he was going back to his corner. This is the Ringside Boxing Show from Monterey, California. I'm Dennis Taylor. We're talking to Christopher James Shelton, the official – Boxing historian of this show. He's been with us for about a decade now. Okay, so along comes this guy, Mike Morrissey. Um, who is he and how does he fit into this story? Well, Mike Morrissey is the, the tale of, you know, we all have our little fantasies. I'm, I'm sure you do too, where we give our Academy Awards speech or we, you know, we hit that home run in the seventh, you know, seventh game of the World Series or, you know what, we could probably take on Mike Tyson or something. You know, we can, we can fight these guys or hold our own. So anyway, Mike Morrissey came from Ireland and he had a promoter and, and this promoter was, was saying he was the Irish heavyweight champion, though these things weren't so easy to confirm in their time. And uh, he really wants to fight the, at the time, undefeated heavyweight champion James Jeffries, who had knocked out Bob Fitzsimmons and taken the unified title. Though, again, there's still a colored heavyweight champion and eventually a black heavyweight champion. But, um, but Jeffries wouldn't fight this guy, not knowing who he was, or they just couldn't set it up. So they got a big high-profile Irish fighter and Peter Mayer to fight this Mike Morrissey. 
and um, it, 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 it received like 500 fans, and people showed up to see this fight, but they're saying that Mike Morrissey was already shaking and nervous before the, the fight even started going up against Mayer. And, uh, you know, Mayer's a very professional guy. I never heard of this Mike Morrissey. So Mike Morrissey, who wanted to fight for the heavyweight champion, well promoted in the newspapers, shows up against Mayer, and Mayer lands a body shot and then follows it with a punch to the jaw, and Mike Morrissey won't get up. He might even be crying, but he was shivering in fear. So, um, um, you know, that's the thing. It's nice to fantasize how we do against a heavyweight champion or a former heavyweight champion, but it's not such a good idea to fight them uh, unless you really know what you're doing. Okay, so now Mayer fights uh, Joe Kowinski again in in 1900, and Ko- Kowinski gets his revenge. Tell us about that bout and and uh, why why it was too late to to have title implications. Well, by this time, Kowinski had probably you know it had just passed him by that that he was going to get um, a title opportunity. I mean, probably probably Jeffries would have faced Kowinski at this point because Jeffries wasn't afraid of anybody, but Kowinski had just gone a little past his time, and he'd given Jeffries that tremendous fight before Jeffries was champion, where again he 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 punched Jeffries so hard Jeffries had never been hit so hard because Jeffries wasn't looking for the right. He had knocked down Kowinski twice, but he wasn't paying attention to the right, and Kowinski hit him so hard his lip embedded into his teeth. And so in between rounds, Jeffries actually said, you know, I'm in so much pain, I cannot continue. And the corner had to get from a guy in the audience a knife, just a regular knife, and cut open uh, Jeffries' lip and, and pull the teeth out in between rounds, and blood gushes everywhere. But anyway, when all said and done, Quincy got a high-profile draw against Jeffries. But by this time, he's a little past his time in his prime. So he fights Peter Mayer, and this time he fights him really smart, like he did, like he should have done the first time around when it was more important. Just boxes him, boxes him, left jab, left jab, left jab to the body, to the face. Mayer can't stop it. Mayer can't do anything about it. Mayer doesn't get knocked out, but he's staggering around, and, and he just can't do anything against Kowinski. But that's always Kowinski. Kowinski never quite fought smart sometimes when he should, and um, and then he fights really smart when it doesn't matter as much. So he did get his revenge and showed that you know he. He could easily defeat Mayer if he just sticks to boxing and doesn't decide to engage and slug it out. And incidentally, Quinsky had no idea of knowing, but it was a year after this. So he's already passed his prime. A year after this, then he knocks out, before he becomes colored and black heavyweight champion, Jack Johnson. Knocks him out in the third round. They're arrested for nearly a month together. And he helped Jack Johnson t- help TB know how to box and how to be defensive. So Quinsky had no idea that you know nine or ten years later, when Jeffries faces um, Johnson for the unified title, all of a sudden Quinsky is a big name because both Jeffries and Johnson say, this guy hit me harder than anybody else. And that boxing historians, not knowing very much really about Quinsky, they don't seem to realize, hey, he doesn't walk in there and slug it out with you. He, he throws a lot of left jabs. He's usually thinner and, and than the guy he faces. And you're just not looking for his right. You're just, you stop paying attention to it because you get hit, hit, hit with his left. And uh, he could really hit hard. He hit Mayer hard, but he didn't knock Mayer out the first time around when he hit him. And this time around, just boxing, 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 and and totally outclassed Mayer, who was also toward the tail end of his career. Okay, so in 1900, which is the same year that Mayer fought Kowinski, uh, Mayer fights again against this this uh, black heavyweight who called himself Klondike. Tell us about Klondike. Who was this guy, and what happened when he fought uh, fought Mayer? Well, I love guys like Klondike. You know, somehow, you know, these, these the, I call them the Ken Burns Club. They all seem to get it in their heads. Certain people, like a cult. So when you hear about the black heavyweights who aren't Jack Johnson, you generally hear about Joe Jeanette and Sam McVay, which is fine. They they should be remembered. But they're sort of forgetting the earlier crop of black fighters um, who were a little bit before their time, and Klondike was one of them. And he also scored a, a TKO of Jack Johnson, I think, in 1899 prior. So he's a good fighter. He had a good record. And his, his nemesis was a great... Um, both colored and black heavyweight champion Frank Childs, who was a little bit smaller guy, but he could hit real hard. And uh, Eric Klondike went up against Frank Childs three times and got knocked out three times. But when he fought other people, again, he defeated Jack Johnson and got a draw with Jack Johnson. And he wouldn't know it, but that would be later kind of his fame because when Jack Johnson became a star on every level, well, then the people that beat him – 
uh, it, it elevated their fame. So Klondike was one of the best, and he fought Peter Mayer, and give Peter Mayer credit, he did fight Black Fighters too, and and um, but Peter Mayer dominated him pretty easily, knocked him down five times, you know, very early in the fight, and then Klondike, when he was on the ground, decided to pull a Tom Sharkey. He, he grabbed Peter Mayer around the legs and yanked him to the ground that way, <laughs> and, and the. Uh, when, he not, when he tackled him to the ground, he tried to throw punches while they were on the ground together, and the referee jumped in. And instead of calling a Tom Sharkey draw, this time he disqualified Klondike. So Peter Mayer did have another high-profile win, and one that he dominated pretty easily against a great heavyweight, Klondike, who, for whatever reason, historians decide to remember some guys and ignore others, and he somehow wound up on the getting ignored list. Okay, so um, how, how do you think you would describe Peter Mayer's legacy? I would describe his legacy that I believe he's legitimately a heavyweight champion because, again, Corbett openly retired, was at the fight, anointed him champion. I don't know how you take that away from him. I think you just have to acknowledge the truth, which boxing historians don't want to do, that you had a title fight between Boffett Simmons and Tom Sharkey and that it was rigged and nobody would accept that it was rigged and that you had to deal with deal with this dishonesty. Um, Bob Fitzsimmons, there's no way to argue that he was the first person to reclaim the championship. And again, if you say, no, it's Floyd Patterson, well, then you're saying Peter Mayer was never champion. And that while Sharkey might have been up to dishonest things, Peter Mayer really doesn't, isn't like that. He was actually a very clean fighter. There's not really, you know, I cover a lot of his fights. There's not a lot of illegal blows or illegal things he's done. He wanted fair and square. If he wasn't one of the top two heavyweights when he fought for the title, I'd say it was probably Fitzsimmons and Kowinski. He was probably in the top five. You know, it wasn't like um, you know, it wasn't like he was a, a guy from nowhere. He had a certain amount of reputation, and um, and then of course, if you take it away from him, then you say no Irishman's ever been heavyweight champion, which is just a glove champion. And that's just, again, it's, it's ridiculous and unfair. You just have to acknowledge there was a fraud, and the decision on the fraud can't be to take away Peter Mayer's heavyweight title or take away his legacy. You just have to decide there's a fraud, and we had to deal with the fraud. It was easy when it was the White Sox because, hey, Cincinnati won. It doesn't matter who lost. This is who won. And now you have a heavyweight title fight where technically Sharkey's the winner, but he's not champion. And that hurt Peter Mayer somehow. Um, Cyber Boxing Zone says that Mayer toured with a, with a vaudeville company, uh, I think in 1895, and he took on all comers. You know anything about that? Well, it's a very common thing, actually. I think it's a really good thing. And he also, you know, did things like they used to do. They used to do a lot of benefits. So he's like benefits for John L. Sullivan. You know, we had keep fueling John L. Sullivan. It kept going through his money pretty fast, even after he was champion, but very well beloved and stuff. And then what Mayer's doing is what a lot of, uh, heavyweights did. Um, is that they tour, and that you know at the time there's no internet, there's no television, there's no radio. So to get to see a heavyweight title fight, especially from Irish blood, the Irish you know really like their own fighters. To get to see a guy like Peter Mayer is exciting, and and guys like Bob Fitzsimmons were really good about it. He would someone like Fitzsimmons would actually pretend it was a real fight, though it wasn't, and he would sometimes get knocked down and knock the other guy down and make it more dramatic. Mayer wasn't quite that much of a showmanship, but but he knew that people wanted to see him, and you get paid money. You're not really going to get hurt, and and actually, like I said, I don't see anything wrong with it. I think that. Uh, if people want to see some guys box and they're kind of famous, you know, why not? So Peter Mayer, you know, did that, and he, he still tried to do what these guys, I guess, still try to do. It's ridiculous. They try to tell jokes. They try to see if they can sing. Because they're Irish, they feel like, can they do a little jig or a little dance or something? <laughs> Mayer naturally wasn't exactly like that. He was a guy that maybe in his heart just wanted to throw punches and please the crowd that way. But but nonetheless, yes, he did try to do all the showmanship things of that time. And again, I think there's nothing wrong with that because, heck, there's nothing to do. So why not go down, you know, in Brooklyn and, and watch a guy, watch Peter Mayer box somebody for a couple of rounds and see a couple other guys that are famous fight. I mean, what the heck else is there to do in the 1890s or ni early 1900s? Do you know anything else about Peter Mayer's life after boxing? Yeah, it says he died in Baltimore in 1940 which would have made him 71, I think. Um, any other information about what happened to him after after his career? No, I don't really. Unfortunately, I don't follow the guys too much after the boxing itself is, is done. If people see my story, one of the things I try to do is because there isn't film of Mayer, is I try to sort of meticulously go through how he actually fought. So you don't just hear... 
You don't just hear, oh, he was a big, tough guy who was a clumsy boxer, which that doesn't tell you anything. I go through the rounds themselves, so you get a real idea how he fought, how he handled situations, and stuff like that. The post-boxing career, as I said, he, he, did, he did do some benefits, and he did do you know, exhibitions and such. And then you, know, you finally get to a certain age, and he was an American. He was always viewed as an Irishman, but he viewed himself as an American. And he settled in to the, to the Northeast, where he, that's where he had most of his attention and such like that. And if he died in 1940, I'm not even sure in his lifetime whether he was acclaimed as a former heavyweight champion or whether that had been stripped of him somehow. Wow. Um, it, it really didn't become high profile, really, until Floyd Patterson tried to, you know, it did successfully reclaim the title because then you heard a lot of attention on Floyd Patterson for reclaiming yep. the title, which again means that Fitzsimmons. You're saying Fitzsimmons didn't reclaim the title, which means you're saying Peter Mayer was never a gloved heavyweight championship. And I feel bad for him. I don't know how much he felt bad for himself um, because he wasn't like Sharky. Sharky kept walking around, hey, I'm heavyweight champion. I'm heavyweight champion. Mayer was modest, and and unfortunately, um, the the squeaky squeaky wheel gets the grease, um, and and Peter Mayer may have been affected negatively by his own modesty and, and the class in which he exhibited himself. Um, in his in his boxing career and 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 afterwards. Okay, always interesting stuff from Christopher James Shelton. Uh, we we do not know how he digs all this stuff up more than a hundred years past uh, the the uh, when it happened, but it's definitely archaeology of some form. And Chris is the Indiana Jones of boxing historians. <laughs> <laughs> I'm turning closer and closer into the Sean Connery guy. <laughs> I'm getting a little older. <laughs> well, you'll be back on top again right after your surgery. Don't worry about Thank that. Thank you. So, all right. Thanks very much, Chris. Great stuff as always, and uh, good luck with your health issues, my friend. Love it, Dennis. Thank you. Okay. That's going to do it for today's Ringside Boxing Show. Hey, be sure to check out the number one website in the world for daily boxing news. We update ringsideboxingshow.com 365 days a year with the biggest headlines and most interesting stories we can find. This should be your first stop every day, and it might be the only stop you'll need for your daily boxing fix. Ringsideboxingshow.com. Check it out right now. Also, do us a favor and tell other boxing fans about the Ringside Boxing Show. Post us on social media. Um, Help us grow. Thanks for being part of our worldwide audience again today, Ringside Nation. I'm Dennis Taylor. Keep your chin tucked. We'll talk to you again next week on the Ringside Boxing Show. Well, it's a great day for me to whoop somebody's ass. It's a bad day, so you better get off of my back. You might get cold, cock. If you cross my path, it's a great day.